C'est qui Qui C'est qui qui n'a studio Hello, hello Welcome to this new episode of Gents. Today, we're talking about pole dancing. Yes, pole dance. Pole dance combines dance and acrobatics centered on a vertical pole. This performance art form takes place not only as erotic dances to be seen by horny men, but also as a mainstream form of fitness practiced in gyms and dedicated dance studios. Pole dancing enthusiasts are of all ages and bodies. Since the mid-2000s, promoters of pole dance fitness competitions have tried to change people's perception of pole dance to include pole fitness as a non-sexual form of dance and acrobatics and are trying to move pole into the Olympics as pole sports. Oddly enough, pole dance in America has its roots in what we called the Little Egypt, which was traveling sideshows of the 1890s, which featured sensual kuta kuta or huchi kuchi belly dances, performed mostly by Hawazi dancers, women who dance for money, making their first appearance in America. In an era where women dressed modestly in corsets, the dancers dressed in short skirts, and they were richly adorned in jewelry, which caused quite a stir. During the 1920s, the circus introduced dancers who would centrally gyrate on the wooden tent poles to attract crowds. Again, the West has been a champion of sexualizing exotic bodies, putting them into the margins of society. Again, Orientalism is quite obvious here as the female bodies coming from the Orient were supposed to be either covered with a hijab because submissive and shackled by an alleged Islamic patriarchy, or they were lustful and lascivious whores, bewitching poor white males with their oriental sense. Well, it happens that I know just the one person who would shatter every stereotype you have on both Muslim women and pole dancers at the same time. Her name is Neda, aka Hijabi Luscious. She is an internet sensation. She gathers around about 80k followers on Instagram with her love, her humor, her thoughts, and her practice. And the community is getting bigger and bigger. Neda is also a young Iranian American Muslim. She is a nurse practitioner living in LA, California, and she is hilarious. So without further ado, dear Neda, thank you for accepting my invitation. Oh, no problem. First question is, so what goes into the head of a Muslim hijabi woman to end up doing pole dance? So at the time, um, so my main sport was swimming. And at the time, I just did a two mile race in the ocean. Um, and I wanted to take a break for a few weeks. So I just wanted to try other things. So I went on like class pass, which tells me all the other like uh, gyms and stuff like that in the area to try for like a trial period. And I saw that there was a pole studio that came up just a mile from me. And that's when I was like, you know what? I want to try some whole shit. That's really just went through my head. I didn't have a specific goal. I was like, okay, well, they said the class is going to be all women. So I was like, well, why not? It's a free class, you know? So when I went, I just thought I would be going there as a joke. I thought that everybody's going to be looking at me for being there. Because I still kept my hijab on because I was like, I don't know if people like are recording in the background or something like that. But it was hard the first couple of classes, but that's what made me keep going back was that it is difficult. And I felt like this was now something I wanted to know that I could do. And also just the environment was super welcoming. Like the women there were super sweet. The instructor was really encouraging. And then I also started to realize like just, just being in class more that like, okay, pole doesn't always have to be sensual, which is fine that it is, you know, but for my purposes of going public, Right. That's something I would have wanted to stay like private about. But I was like, wow, there's different types of pole. Like there's more of like an acrobatic part of it, too, that I actually do feel comfortable sharing. How has pole affected your relationship with your body? You're saying yourself on the videos you often post that there's always a hoe under the hijab, right? So sometimes you're wearing makeup, 
high heels or silky red fabric? Do you feel sexier when pole dancing? I even remember you wanted to even make a lingerie line called Hasi Hijabi. <laughs> so do you feel kind of sexier when pole dancing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So, I mean, I don't know if sexy is the right word, but because like, I think what, I think the better way I describe it for myself is that it makes me feel a lot more in tune with my body. It makes me feel like I have a lot more autonomy over my body because especially like, you know, a lot of other like Muslim people or Middle Eastern people, we grow up with like a lot of like control and emotional abuse because I think culturally it's very normalized when it shouldn't be. So what, what, what comes with that territory is not having, um, you don't feel like your body is yours. Um, you feel like it belongs to the family in some way or that you're an extension of the family. And even though that's not, it's not always a bodily thing, it's still very much an emotional thing. And you need those emotions to connect with your body to begin with. So at least for me, like with pole, just because of the amount of patience and bodily awareness you need to do pole safely, like I feel, I feel like that's what made me feel a lot more confident in my body, especially like, you know, for me, I'm considered a little bit bigger. Like I'm, I'm almost 190 pounds. So just, just knowing that I could do what I could do at my weight as well. Um, because I think anything with ballet, gymnastics or anything like that, like, uh, people grow up believing that you have to be skinny in order to physically accomplish those goals. And that's not true. Coming back to the modesty in Islam, I think narrow-minded people take it as a synonym of prudishness, which is not the same. Um, to quote a small verse from the Quran, 726, O children of Adam, we have provided for you clothing to cover your nakedness and as an adornment. However, the best clothing is righteousness. So piety and devotion to Allah are the best clothing and it only affects oneself. It's funny because you stage yourself to be seen on Instagram and yet your body is covered with a hijab. So for some people, it's an interesting paradox. Like a hijabi woman shouldn't be seen doing things like this. But I guess you're giving them the middle finger, right? I think that when you wear hijab, like people are going to say something no matter what. Even I was, I've been wearing hijab since I was 21. I've only been pole dancing for two and a half of those years of wearing hijab. And I'm 34 now. I was getting the same comments before I was doing pole. And I think that comes with being a, a bigger woman. I mean, I have a bigger ass and I have like large breasts. Like, you know, that's already not, that already makes people uncomfortable. I think both features are easily sexualized. And so, I mean, you don't, I don't, I don't see skinny women being told that they need to wear bag gear clothes. That's just, you know, it comes with bigger women, right? That was going to happen either way. So I was like, if y'all going to make the comments that you do, well, like even outside of pole, I'm just going to do what I want then. Yeah, so I get from what you're saying that pole dancing has almost made you a better Muslim in a way. Because you learn about embracing all parts of your body and mind, that you don't care about other people's judgments, uh, but you don't judge yourself, etc., etc. How do you feel about that? If y'all believe that hijab includes covering your figure, right? you are free to believe that. I just say it's a lot harder to achieve that when you're thick. Even like you could see my figure even if I wear like an abaya. Like, and I'm not about to wear an abaya that's two sizes large just to conceal like what God has given me. A lot of ideas of modesty, a lot of people's ideas of modesty is disappearance. You know, you want me to make sure that my big ass titties are not known. Like you want, you want to believe that they are not there. I'm not doing that. Like I have a big ass, like deal with it. <laughs> And I mean, that's how I was raised as soon as I was, as soon as I hit puberty, it's like, you know, my mom was buying me like clothes that were two sizes too large and buying me bras that were meant to like flatten me. And it's like, why, why are you doing this to a 13 year old? So yeah, that's why I have such like, um, a strong feeling of like, I'm not hiding anything. I'm all being modest. But if, if y'all believe that I should be, I should be covering my figure up, like good luck. You're fine to have that belief. It's just not what I do. Well, I have been through enough like Islamic courses, you know, going to halakha and everything like that. And I have done my reading. You know, I know what the texts say. And when people come at me with this kind of stuff, I'm just like, you don't read, you know, 
you 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 learned it from somebody that you know who also that person learned it from like a well trusted uncle. Did anyone need check uncle sources? You know, y'all just have accepted that because it's from an elder, and then you pass that down, and you end up you know passing that information down to other impressionable Muslims. For me, I'm not impression. I don't consider myself impressionable. I've done my reading. Although I was wondering, do you think you've been kind of sexualized because you wore hijab and performed as a pole dancer? Do you think there is sort of a, a white male gaze on your performance? I mean, I think people think that it is for the male gaze simply because I am on a pole, you know, and I don't deny that pole comes from stripping. I think that just because people see a pole like that is inherently sexual, you know, but that's their problem. If they think that a pole is for the male gaze, I don't know what to tell you because poles hold up buildings. They hold up stop signs, you know, in gymnastics, mm -hmm. they have one, but it's horizontal. Like, are you just going to sexualize every single pole you see? Because that's just like, like uh, you, you've got a problem if you're doing that. I totally understand that pole is associated with stripping, but I just tell people like, where do you see my clothes coming off? Do you see me shaking my ass? Like I'm obviously fully clothed. If you want to visualize something that's not there that's not my problem when we portray the archetype of what a pole dancer is we reckon it's a cisgender straight feminine thin blonde haired and white woman yet when you took your first class of pole dancing you said in interviews that the teacher was very welcoming and body positive So do you think that there should be more inclusivity in the industry in terms of uh, of practice, of equipment, even pole wear for bigger bodies? I think what white people are appealed to me, pole dancing, is that I look like a lot of other people. I, I think I have a normal body. There's, I don't think, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being skinny, but, you know, I think that when the majority of like ballerinas, gymnasts, and, you know, acrobats and so on are one body type, People think that if they are not that body type, they can't do it. So I think when people see me doing it, they're like, oh, maybe I can. You know, I look like her. Maybe I can do that. You know, I don't think the goal should be to just stop sexualizing like pole entirely because there is a sexual aspect of it. Um, I just don't really participate in, in that category, you know, because there's like eight or nine different types of categories in pole. I think the goal would be that if people see me, doing poll, they think that, hey, maybe I can do it and get the benefits of it as well. I think the inclusion would be the goal. I think it's a more uh, effective goal than let's just stop sexualizing poll entirely. I also love how much of a role model you're becoming for little Muslim girls. And I can think of other figures that I think it's high time we mentioned them in the media, like the very well-known American hijabi fencer, Ibtihaj Muhammad. The Australian young woman named uh, Stephanie Curlow, who is also the worst first professional hijabi ballerina. The Abu Dhabi-born figure skaters Zahra Lari. These are all trailblazing hijabi athletes who are bending the norms in sports today. Some hijabis are even taking up what's perceived as masculine sports, like Emirati Amnan Haddad in weightlifting, or Iranian Shirin Garami, who's a triathlete and first Iranian woman to be an Iron Man world champion. Maybe now they should call it an Iron Woman. So what's your message to Muslim women who may feel like sports is not for them because they wear hijab? Or even to those who fear being judged for joining a pole class? I think if it's for Muslim women specifically, first of all, I went public with my journey. That does not mean you have to as well. Like some people are fine doing things in private. Um, I only went public because that's just my personality. You know, um, I was used to doing things like public speaking and, you know, I have a history of competition and everything like that. This is just what I'm used to. Not everybody's cool with that. And that's totally fine. You know, so if you want to keep your journey private, it is totally fine. You know, um, now as far as like people who are scared to go on competition because they wear hijab, I would just say that like, God gave you this body. Like, are you, are, are you, are you just going to sit there and not use it? Like, of course, you use it for praying and reading Quran and everything like that. But it's like, you know, you also have a responsibility to maintain it and make healthy choices to respect the body that God gave you. 
at participating in sports is how you see your body's full potential. And that's what gets me closer to God is just being like, like, wow, like, thank God I feel good and I'm strong enough to do this, you know, um, and for this, for this potential, I didn't know I had. So how do you handle what you call the haram police and the dozens of critics you must have gone through? One of your main characteristics is that you actually do not care and always speak your truth. Uh, you get a lot of uh, gaslighting and insults for it. So how come it doesn't impact your mental health that much? Is there a secret to make haters shut up? There is nothing that anyone can say to me that will beat what I was raised with. Okay, it is sad, but I don't care. Like, you know, my parents, I grew up with my parents saying much worse to me. When people say what they do, I'm just like, is that mm -hmm. all you got? Like, and I, you know, like, um, that doesn't change that I'm a sensitive person. I realize what my limits are. Um, sometimes I get hateful messages and stuff, but I just, I just remember that, like, I'm not here to try to change your opinion. You can have your opinion and I'm going to let you know it's a garbage one, but like, they don't pay my bills. Um, and I, I use them to my advantage. That's why I post what I do sometimes that I, I post my comebacks and everything like that, because I know that a majority of people that are like on TikTok, Instagram or whatever are in their early twenties. They are impressionable. There was a time when I was a lot more impressionable. But I at least try to show people how to respond to their like internal Haram police. A lot of people have internalized those same insults. Anytime I post a response to like somebody who's saying hateful messages, it gets a lot of engagement, you know, on my profile. I get paid a little bit for views and stuff like that. So like if I get more profile engagement, I get more money. So I'm just like, you wanted to say what you said? Okay. Like, well, it's my property now. This message is mine. So I will, I'll, I'll make money <laughs> off of it. I don't care. Like, <laughs> you know, you can't try to hurt me for free. Like, <laughs> do you do less pole dancing because it's Ramadan? Have you ever thought it could be disrespectful for people who follow you? Well, I mean, the only reason I'm doing less um, right now is just because pole is physically tiring. Um, You know, it's not because I think it's immodest. Um, like, okay, if I was like, let's say twerking or something, you know, using a lot of like, like explosive music or something like that. Okay, I wouldn't be doing that. I don't see it as something that is violating a religious boundary for me. The only reason I'm decreasing it and doing more conditioning stuff, like I said, it's just physically taxing. So in general, I have to watch out how I'm exercising when I'm fasting. Some expect that only Muslim men would be harsh, but I guess Muslim women are also very angry at the way you own your life and body, right? Because, according to them, you're not respecting what they think is the best way to be a Muslim woman, especially when you wear the hijab, right? Well, I, I get a lot more support than I do hate, right? And on Instagram, I haven't gotten a hateful message in like a, in a few months. You know, I get way more supportive messages. As far as the women... Like, I mean, internalized misogyny is a real thing, and that's not just for Muslims. It's women that think that they're going to get ahead by playing the rules of the men. They think that they are better women because they are meeting these male expectations. That's how internalized misogyny works, and that is not limited to just Muslim women. Yeah, and I think some of it is an age thing, too, for me. You know, um, like, I think I would have been a lot more heated if I was, like, in my like early 20s if I was in college and that is a majority of people who use social media right now is college mid-20s you know I've had time to be comfortable with who I am like I've had enough like decision making over my own life I just know who I am but that's come with age I was not like this when I was 24 I was a lot more insecure I don't think that pole is inherently immodest You know, I don't think that this is some kind of like sexual endeavor that like, you know, needs to be toned down. This is what keeps me strong. This is where I feel my full potential. Like I have massive shoulders, you know, and I have really big arms. Like I want to maintain that. Last question is, pole dancing is obviously linked in people's minds to sex workers and strippers. So there's always some horophobia. Yeah, because I can think of some feminists who call themselves swerves 
which stands for Sex Work Exclusionary Radical Feminists. So is there a way we could compare the stigma around sex work with the stigma around wearing the hijab insofar as it's always about patriarchy wanting to control women's bodies, right? Aren't women smart adults who can make their own decisions about their own bodies and what they wear? Well, I think both. I mean, I think they're both extremes on the same spectrum, you know, with sex workers. I've been told that, you know, um, they're wearing too little, you know, um, and that like and and that like it's a function of patriarchy and everything. But then with hijabis, we're being told that we're wearing too much and that and that we're doing it for the male gaze. So it's like you can't win either way. Like, okay, I wear hijab because of the male gaze, but then like sex workers are doing their work because of the male gaze as well. The way I see with sex workers that like is that like y'all have made an in not not sex workers, but in general, y'all have made an industry on sexualizing women. You know, like rappers like Snoop Dogg or even perform whatever kind of performer, they bring strippers onto the stage, you know, um to perform with them. Um in movies like superfluous sex scenes are left and right. You know, um, there's always going to be some kind of sex scene that doesn't need to be there that does not add to the storyline. Like sexualizing women in the modeling industry is, I mean, that's what it's rampant. So people are mad, though, when sex workers will take that money on their terms. Like the rest of the industry is fine sexualizing women. But as soon as like, you know, the woman decides that like, hey, I'm going to make money off of myself, too. then everyone gets mad. You know, I don't post anything uh, about my partner on Instagram, even though we've been, you know, we've been together for years. Like, you know, I don't post anything because it's not people's business. Some of the comments will be like that I'm doing this for other men, you know, um, that like it's implied that like I'm sleeping around, like weird shit like that, that I'm just like, this is so ridiculous. I can't even there what they try to imply from that. Like it is entirely their problem. And I don't think that people like that, that actually think this way, are successful in their own relationships. So we will wrap this up. But first, in each episode of Gents, we kind of deconstruct together a myth or a lie that I have been told or that I have often heard of. So without specifically going into personal details, you've been quite outspoken regarding how abusive your parents were. Um, the fear of being disowned, the stares, the love bombing, uh, the threats, the guilt, etc. And I wanted to ask you this, following what an uncle of mine kept on repeating to me when I was a teenager. He said, those are your parents. They made you. You wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. You owe them everything. You owe them your life. No matter what they do to you or whether they make you suffer, They do it because they love you. It's written in the Quran that you shouldn't say to them so much as oof. What would you have answered to that? I would just say, are y'all forgetting that even dictators have children? You know, it's not that hard to procreate. Like, I mean, I, I did not ask, you know, I didn't ask to come to an existence. Like, y'all decided to have kids to try to fix your marriage. And now you're burdening me with like, with, with having to be thankful for that. Even from an Islamic standpoint, the whole obedience to your parents is under the assumption that they have fulfilled their duties as parents. Okay, but no parent wants to talk about that because it is a power structure. They're not going to accept accountability from their child because the parents see them as above. You know, they see themselves as above them. What I have to say to that, it says explicitly in the Quran that even if it's against your parents or your family or even yourselves, you speak out for justice, even if it's against them. If my parents have done multiple injustices towards me, towards other family, I'm speaking out against it. Okay, Nida, thank you very much. It was very interesting and I had so much fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Be it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Deezer or else, don't forget to subscribe to Jin's podcast account and to leave your questions and comments. Remember, you'll find all the aforesaid references in the description below, as I did every single time during season one. For the most curious minds among you, I'll put a few book and film recommendations linked to today's topic. Go subscribe to Jeans Podcast on Instagram at J-I-N-S underscore podcast. Don't hesitate to share around every time you listen to an episode 
because you should always remember that someone, somewhere, somewhat needs a new light shed on Islam, gender identity, sexualities, Arab origins, or anything that can be prone to oppression. So please do your part and pass the word around. See you next week.